Good evening to you again. Uh, this is uh, class number 15 in uh, our course on the Holy Spirit. I'd like to take up again where we left off in our last class, which was on, we were speaking specifically about brokenness and how important brokenness is in the life of the believer. We have looked at the verses that deal with the inner man and the outer man and use the analogies that are given to us in scripture about <clears throat> the breaking open of the alabaster box and uh, I have not yet addressed the work of the Holy Spirit in all this but we will especially since this is a doctrine a study on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit but I want you to kind of appreciate in, in what we might consider to be an initial way that the Holy Spirit is constantly working in our life I mentioned over and over again that he will not coerce us, coerce us he will not force us uh, to really do anything. Uh, he's not one who's going to twist our arm uh, to get us to do what he wants us to do. So you have to choose to follow his leading in your life. You have to make a choice that you are going to allow him to lead your life. Romans chapter 8 14 is the classic verse on this. We'll study this in our next semester uh, when we look at uh, Romans chapter 8 in uh, great detail. And what we will f you'll find there in that verse, Romans 8 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So one of the attributes, one of the characteristics of those who are the sons of God is that they are being led by the Spirit of God. They are, they are men and women who uh, follow the leading, the guidance uh, uh, that the Holy Spirit provides both in His Word and individually. But one of the things that you can be sure of in this matter of the Holy Spirit working in our life, and this is really not a very pleasant thing to to come to. It's not what easy Christianity is really looking for. Is I think that the Holy Spirit, just by the very nature of the work that is taking place in us, is sort of breaking down of different uh, parts of our life so that the life of Christ can be manifested in that area that what we'll find is that there most likely will be one difficulty after another, one struggle after another, one, one problem after another, one obstacle, one stumbling block after another in our life. And I, I don't know any, way, any other way to state it, but I believe that that's part of the design. That is the way that the Christian life works. Um, and the reason is so that the outer man can be broken. It's these trials, these obstacles, these difficulties, these problems, the, the very difficult times that we find ourselves in. It's so that the outer man can be broken. It's, it's amazing <laughs> to me, unfortunately, how, how much we often complain about everything. You know, you probably know people and have met people and they just constantly are complaining about anything and everything. They're never satisfied. They don't like this. They're having to stand in line too long in Walmart. Listen, if you're going to go to Walmart, you can be assured before you ever get there that most likely there's going to be a long line. So just accept that and move on. They're just things that people complain about. They don't like this. They don't like that. Um, and it's just amazing how much we have learned how to complain. We complain about this person and that person and this situation and my job and I don't like it and it's boring and um, we just find so many things to complain about. We don't like the way this has turned out. We don't like how this affects us. So we just complain all the time and if the truth were really known 
I think that we are actually complaining about the things that God wants to use in our life to conform us to the very image of Jesus Christ. So we are complaining about the very things that we absolutely need the most. You can't be patient, you can't learn to be patient until you are put into some impatient situations. There have to be some things that are, are going to make you impatient. You have to be put into those situations before, you have to be put in that negative circumstance before the positive characteristic of Christ can be worked into your life. It really is a great arrogance on our part to think that God can use us like we are. What a, what a misunderstanding of, of immense magnitude to think that God can use me the way that I currently am. Uh, or that we are good enough for God's service and, and, and we're good enough for God to use us without any significant changes having to take place in our life. I, 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 I'm of the opinion, uh, I'm very biased about this and very prejudiced about this, that God is, is, is always working to change different areas of our life. Uh, always. It's not like there's sometimes when He's not and sometimes when He is. He's always working to change our life uh, and make significant changes in our life. If we really understood how utterly stubborn that we are at times about almost everything, it could be one of the most humbling events of our life. Lest we forget, I want to read to you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that this treasure that we have is in an earthen vessel. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, but we have this treasure, this, what is the treasure? In earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of may be of God and not of us. So, we have to appreciate that we are not the treasure. It's not my understanding, it's not my theological position that's the treasure, it's not, it's, it's, it's not my oratory ability or probably the lack of oratory ability. It's, it's the treasure is Christ. The treasure is the indwelling Spirit of God that is the Spirit of Christ that lives in me, that lives in you. And so the treasure is Christ, and it's the life of Christ. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ that is the hope. It's always about Christ. He is the central component of everything that's important in the Christian life. Everything revolves around the person of Jesus Christ. So the Lord has one objective, and that is to break my inner man, my outer man, and to deplete me of myself so that he can be manifested. It's not me that he wants people to see. It's Christ in me that he wants people to see. I'm not sure, but what Luke 9.23, we've looked at this, is the most demanding scripture in, in all of scripture where it tells us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross daily, and to follow Him. And there, and there are two things that I want to mention here. And the first is this thing of denying ourselves. It is so demanding. I, you know, when I read those scriptures, I, I know I've talked about this before, when I read those scriptures, they are just unyielding. There's just no place there. They're just unbending. It never moves. Every single time that I read that verse, it says the same exact thing. It never gets softened. Here's what it says. It says that whatever I do that dishonors God, and whatever I do that damages my body, that I am to deny myself of those things. Everything that I do that fails to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ, I am to deny myself in doing those things. Wow! I, we're talking about something that is unbending, unyielding, something that is always there before us. Uh, and, it's, and I'm the one that has to do that. Let's, listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19 through 20, 
It's clear when Paul writes, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It's like Paul says, do you just not know these things? I mean, is there something here that you just haven't figured out yet? Is this not on your screen? Is it not visible to you? Is this here something, is there something missing here? I mean, he asked the question, do you not know? It's, it's a question that begs an answer. It's, it's like the Corinthians are living in such a way that they've taken something that's absolutely fundamental to what it means to be a Christian. And Paul is even wondering if they even understand and know what it is that he's talking about here. So... And then he talks about taking up his cross, and in very simple terms, this idea of denying myself and, and, and taking up his cross is simply God's way of breaking my outer man. It's dying to what I want to do. It's dying to what I want to say. It's dying to how I want to live. It's breaking my outer man so that Christ in me the Spirit of God in me that magnifies Christ can be released and flow through me. If we are not Christ-like in all that we do, listen, I know this may sound a little over the top, so just adjust it, but we're just wasting our life. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. And the whole purpose of our Christian life is so that we can magnify the person of Christ. So that we can extol Him. So that we can honor Him. And anything else in my life that is, is not honoring to Christ. You know, this is not saying that you can't do something. This is not saying that you can't enjoy life. The Bible has clearly stated that He's given us all things richly to enjoy. I, I, I You know, I, I shared earlier, I, I love to play golf. I, I uh, uh, my sons love to play, and uh, uh, one of my sons lives with us, and, and the other son uh, lives about an hour away. And uh, you know, we get together at times and we play golf. There's nothing sinful about playing golf. There's something sinful about the fact if I get mad and get frustrated and get angry and throw my club and 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 just stomp out kind of mad and and uh, say some ugly things. That's that's bad. That's, that's not right. There, there, there are things that God has given us to enjoy. Uh, if you took your kids to Disney World, have a great time. Just have an absolutely wonderful time. Just, just be Christ-like. You know, when you greet people in a restaurant, you, if you've got to stand in a line, you know, uh, strike up a conversation with somebody. Talk to them. Communicate. Be gracious to them. Be, be kind to them. And so, this idea, you know, of not being Christ-like, of not allowing that spirit of Christ and that fragrance of Christ to be released out of our life, we're just wasting our life. And, and we contribute no meaningful usefulness or spiritual value to God's work when that's taking place in our life. In fact, we may even be found to be a hindrance in what it is that God actually would like to do. A hindrance to the work of the Spirit of God. No wonder some people have to be put on the shelf. It's, it's because they're not allowing the, that, 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 inner, that outer man to be broken so that the Spirit of Christ and the, and the life of Christ can be manifested through them. And so the cross is simply God's way of breaking down our outer man and breaking us of our valued opinions and breaking us of our cleverness and our shrewdness and all of our ingenuity and all of those things uh, that we use to get what we want and to live how we want to do. And it's, it's, he's using these elements to break us 
uh, of our love for ourselves and all of our selfish interest and us wanting to do, live the way that we want to live. It's just something that has to take place. It's a, it's a deep work of God. I mean, what does God really want from us? I mean, maybe that's the question. Maybe, maybe that's the point that we're really driving at. Listen, here's what God wants. I, I want this to be simple. I want this to be understandable. I want this to be so clear by the time that we get through that we say, that's what I'm going to live for. What God really wants for us is that we become like Christ. It's not that I be some great preacher. You know that I write 57 books. It's not that I do this or do that. It's that I become like Christ. If I become like Christ, if I allow Christ likeness to be developed in my life, God will use me. And if I don't allow that Christ likeness to be developed, in all likelihood, my usefulness in the kingdom of God will be severely minimized. To become Christ like, there must come. This brokenness, though, it's not an easy thing. It's a consecration of our life for the great purposes that God has already ordained for us to walk in. It's a willingness to allow His work to be an instrument that breaks, a, breaks us of ourselves so that His divine life can flow through this earthen vessel so that the treasure that's in the earthen vessel can be released. Now, up to this point, I've had one area of concern, and that is not giving to us a, a list of do's and don'ts uh, that will make us Christ-like. I, I, for me personally, it's just me... Uh, there's something about that approach. There's something vital that's actually missing in that kind of approach. Ultimately, I think we'll have to talk about those kind of things in order to be faithful to Scripture. But just to embrace a, a long list of spiritual activities is not where we actually need to begin. Any, anybody can come up with a list of spiritual principles to follow. You know, write them down, one, two, three, this is what you do. It's, it, for me, personally, it's not a list that I'm looking for. It's a perspective. It's an attitude. It's, it's a seeing life from God's perspective. It's sort of getting behind God's eyes, if you would, and being able to see life from God's perspective. So, but, you know, Christ just generally does not just teach a list of things to do. Um, it's not, uh, it, it's not a, a list of principles out there that He gives us, even though they're there, obviously, in the Scriptures. Everything is related to someone having a personal relationship with Christ. Having a personal relationship with Christ. I can master, you know, I have people all the time. I, this is one of my fetishes. This is one of those areas of my life that I know that God has to work on me on. I, 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 I am just bored to tears at times. List uh, with all these programs that they have on the radio related to the family. I, I'm, I'm for the family. I'm for a great marriage. I, I'm, I'm really for a great marriage. I, I'm, I'm for the family. I'm for my children. I'm for my grandchildren and the kids in our church and all of that. I, I, I've, done, I've done enough teaching on the family and on marriage. In fact, I, I had somebody recently came to, uh, that came to one of the members of our church and said, Gary, would you please please uh, teach that series that you did on marriage previously. Would you, would you please do that uh, for us? And uh, uh, I, I, it, it's almost like they would want me to teach on that every week. 
you know, all these great things about marriage and about family. And I just, uh, I, 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 it's just a fetish of mine. It's just one of those areas I have to work on. I, I, I get tired of listening about the family all the time. Uh, you know, the, the, the movie, I mean, the, the, uh, the radio programs that are on. I mean, they, you know, they, they're all about the family, the family, the family, the family. And that's a great thing. There's nothing wrong with having a good family. But I can marriage all of the marriage principles known to man, but what my wife is really interested in is whether or not I'm having a personal and meaningful relationship with her. It's not that I got all the principles down, you know, and I buy her flowers when I'm gone and get her some jewelry in the airport or something. And, you know, my wife wants to have a personal relationship with me. Forget all the principles. They're good. They're godly. They're right. But she, more than anything else, wants to have a meaningful relationship to me. If we get in the car and go somewhere, if we're sitting down to eat, she wants to have a meaningful conversation. She wants to know that she has my attention, that I'm listening. She wants me to be affectionate. She wants me to, to uh, you know, to know what she's doing, to know where she's going. Uh, she wants me uh, to remark on how she looks, if she's attractive, if this looks good on you, if that doesn't look good on you, I'd rather you wear something else. She loves those kind of things. Your mate loves those kind of things. And so that's what's important to her. So success in the Christian life is not just dependent on me understanding some kind of complex spiritual principle that's out there, some kind of doctrinal system, you know, uh, uh, you know, whether I'm Reformed or non-Reformed or a Calvinist or uh, Arminian or whether I'm a pre-trib or a pre-wrath or an amillennialist or a, those things are important and we need to have an understanding of all those kind of things. Uh, and it's certainly not revolved around me having some kind of mystical, secret, spiritual experience that brings me out of the, you know, the darkness, and now I have all this light, and it's flooding my soul. It's not that at all. It's my personally having a meaningful relationship with a person called Jesus Christ. I, we can understand everything there is to know about brokenness and never be broken. We can understand everything there is to know about a particular doctrinal position, and it never impact our life. What's purposeful in the Christian life is that I have a meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what is the life-transforming experience for us. That's where the Holy Spirit is leading us. I understand that principles and instructions and guidelines are vitally important for every Christian. I mean, if you're going to go somewhere, you need some good directions. You need some, some very, very good directions. In fact, there is an abundance of biblical teaching on the issue of sanctification, and it all points to the fact, every bit of it points to the fact that it's very possible to simply be ignorant of certain spiritual elements, and therefore there is a, a need to learn the difference between what is right and what is wrong, to learn what God expects of every Christian. Those things are there. A young believer, for instance, may certainly be excused for a, for a certain level of spiritual ignorance. I mean, somebody that just got saved, somebody that's only been a Christian for four or five months, certainly there are things that they cannot know about the Christian life that somebody like you or me, we can know. We can know those things. But to continue in a condition in that condition, to remain spiritually ignorant, to never grow, is where the problem exists and is what needs to be, to ultimately be addressed. This is the issue of sanctification. It's always about going forward in the things of Christ. It's always about learning more about Christ. It's not just learning some principles. Principles are great. I love the principles. They give me guidelines and direction for my life, but it's Am I growing in my personal relationship to Jesus Christ? Do I feel drawn to Him? Do I feel, do I feel uniquely um, drawn into His presence and, and into the life that He has to offer and to give? And so, um, 
Uh, these principles are good, but we have to learn. We have to, we have to learn what it means to have a meaningful relationship with a person. And so I, I've come to the realization that the decisions that will ultimately develop Christ-likeness in my life personally are not mental or intellectual decisions. Uh, I study the Bible constantly, just constantly. Um, I, I, and, and I'm studying different sections of Scripture, teaching at church, teaching in school, teaching different courses. I'm teaching courses overseas. Uh, it's, it, there's, just, there's, there's a whole plethora of, of subjects and ideas. They're all important. They're all, they're all very, very good. I, I teach a, a three-semester course on theology on the great doctrines of Scripture, from the doctrine of God all the way through the doctrine of the Christian life and the doctrine of the church and the doctrine of Christ and the Holy Spirit, uh, just different major doctrines that are, in, that are part of what it really means to be a Christian. But I, I, I've come to appreciate and realize that, that those things that ultimately affect my life the most are moral decisions. Moral decisions. In other words, I can have everything correct doctrinally. I can have everything correct intellectually, yet still remain exactly the same. You know, I, I, we have, uh, I think the word that I would use that I kind of relate to, especially from my experiences. Uh, in Romania is that they are tremendously orthodox. Now orthodox, being orthodox is, is not what I'm interested in, certainly not what you're interested in. Uh, I'm not interested in being conservative or radical or anything. I'm interested in being Christ-like, in my behavior, in my perspective, in my life. Uh, that includes being doctrinally correct. All right? I mean, Christ was doctrinally correct. The more Christ-like we become, the more doctrinally correct, I think, that we ultimately will become. But I, I, can, uh, I can know all the principles and all the rules and all the guidelines and it not take me anywhere. I mean, I think that the Pharisees had that down pat. I mean, they were as orthodox as the day was long. I mean, they, they were super, uh, you know, they were hyper-orthodox. But it didn't do them any good. You want to know why? Because they didn't have a personal relationship with God. They didn't have a, they, they had all the guidelines and all the principles down right, but they didn't have a personal relationship with God. And everything that they had learned was of no value to them. And I think the same can take place. You know, many Christians have grown in their knowledge of Christ without growing in, in, in their relationship to Christ. I've had a lot of students over the years that were like that. They were so intellectually minded that they had forgotten what the Christian life was about. I mean, they were so adamant about, about, uh, about certain doctrinal positions that they had forgotten completely what it really meant to even be a Christian. And so... Uh, you know, if we don't have meaningful communion with Christ, and for the most part our life is not going to have a great deal of value. It's not going to be something that's going to be useful. There's always this danger of our celebrating what Christ has done while at the same time forgetting the need, the important need for us to surrender to Him. You know, we're celebrating the cross. That's a great thing, God forbid, except I should glory in the cross. Uh, we're celebrating those kind of things in our life, but we're forgetting this, this idea of us surrendering our life to Him. You know, we got all our doctrine down. You know, we can argue and debate. We can, we can talk about the cults and where they are and why they're in the wrong place, but still not have a meaningful relationship with Christ. 
we must be aware of the curse of becoming spiritually stationary rather than going on, as 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 says, and perfecting the holiness of God, uh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The word perfecting is a present tense verb signifying that there is something that we are to always be doing. Perfecting and keep on perfecting. Maturing and keep on maturing. Hebrews 6.12 talks about those who become sluggish. And the word sluggish there means to be lazy, to be slothful, to be dull. So there are just things in my life that I need to be perfecting. The worst thing that I can do is to become spiritually stationary in my walk and in my relationship to God. You know, I, I can honestly say I've, I've been married for 42 years. And I love my wife more now than I have ever loved her in my life. I, I, we've not, we've, we, it's, I, I can't remember a time, and I'm sure there was, where we were just stationary. You know, where, where there was nothing ever developing. I am more dependent on her than I've ever been dependent on her. I have a relationship with her and I keep building on that relationship. And, and, and but sometimes we, we get so bogged down in just the minutia of doctrine, and, and I, I'm a doctrinal nut. I'm a church nut. I'm a doctrinal nut. I am just, my whole life bleeds doctrine. I want to understand doctrine. I want to, I, I want to teach doctrine. That's basically what I teach primarily, is doctrine and theology. I, I want to teach the doctrinal books. I want to teach uh, Romans, I want to teach Hebrews, I want to teach Galatians, I want to teach Ephesians, I want to teach those courses that are doctrinal in nature. Uh, I'm not very good on the narrative portions of, of, of Scripture. Um, and, and, and I don't enjoy teaching them nearly as much. Uh, and, and so I'm a, I'm a doctrinal nut, but I, I, don't want to, I don't want to become so doctrinal that I have nothing personal taking place in my relationship to Christ. Now, there are three very definitive and inescapable aspects in the matter of Christ-likeness. And all are critical if a person is going to become Christ-like. I say become Christ because Christ-likeness is not an event. You know, if, if, <clears throat> if in all of this, <clears throat> and the way that I've taught this to you uh, on this section of Christ-likeness and th that work of the Holy Spirit in our life is that if, if, it, if the perception that you have is that Christ-likeness is something that we are right now, then I probably have miscommunicated a little bit. Because I am always in the process of becoming Christ-like. I may have Christ-like characteristics. I may not have Christ-like characteristics, but I may have Christ-like characteristics that have been developed in my life, certainly not fully mature. None of them are fully mature in any sense of the word. Won't be until I'm redeemed. But I am in that process. I, the work of the Holy Spirit is taking me every day, guiding me, leading me, controlling me, you know, prompting me, urging me to become more Christ-like. So it's, it's not an event, it's not just a state in which I live, but rather it is a process of becoming Christ-like. And I think it, it is the process of, theologically, it is the process of sanctification. And it's a very difficult, very strenuous, very demanding, lifelong process. It is not easy. It does not come easy. Its demands are not easy. There's nothing easy about it. We don't need to make it easy. We don't need to teach it in an easy way. We don't need to try to sort of camouflage, if you would, and to put cosmetics over what really is a very difficult process in our life. It's not something you just wake up with one morning or something that you 
do not have to diligently pursue. It requires your total being. It requires effort. It requires mental effort. It requires emotional effort. It, 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 it requires a deep spiritual effort on our part to become Christ-like. And to the contrary, Christ-likeness is something that has a tremendous cost to it. And uh, until we accept that cost, it will be very difficult to have a meaningful uh, work towards Christ-likeness to actually take place within our life. It's just a very, very strenuous effort. Now, I emphasize all of this simply because I don't want to give any anyone the impression that this thing of becoming Christ-like, this process, is trouble-free, non-demanding, painless, just tranquil, passive, stress-free. It's the very opposite. It's none of that. It's a continual process of being broken. Today you got to be broken. Tomorrow you got to be broken. The next day you got to be broken so that the life of Christ can be visibly manifested in your life and through your life. You have to become a living sacrifice. And there's nothing easy about any of that. Now, I want you to think of this process of becoming Christ-like in three specific terms. I've already mentioned one of them. I'll go over it. I want you to... I, 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 I'm one of those guys that do not teach with alliterations. I don't like alliterations. I, I, it's just one of those fetishes of mine. I don't, I, I don't see it in the Scripture. I don't see that Christ taught that way. I don't see... I, I don't see that any of the disciples taught that way or Paul taught that way. I don't... I don't see them. I'm not saying it's wrong. It's certainly not wrong. I'm just saying it's not something that I, I do. In fact, normally if I have an alliteration, everything starting with the same letter, I'll go back and change one of the letters just so I don't have to have an alliteration. I, I would not be good teaching a homiletics class. I probably would be uh, very poor in, in teaching that. But I want this in this case I have three three areas, and I want to give those to you, three areas of becoming Christ-like. The first is consecration, consecration, being consecrated to Christ. The second is concentration, concentrating on certain things. And the third is commitment. One leads to the other. Concent consecration should lead to concentration, which ought to lead to to commitment. In, in other words, you will never be truly committed to Christ's likeness in your life if you have never separated yourself to Christ or if you have never concentrated and deliberated on what it is to be Christ-like. In other words, if there's no concentration, if there's no deliberation about, about Christ-likeness, what it means, how somebody becomes Christ-like, then then there can't be any consecration in that area. You know, there can't be any commitment to something that you don't understand. So, uh, you, you will never be truly committed to Christ-likeness if, if you've never separated yourself to Christ or deliberated on what all of that means. So first I want to address again the issue of consecration, which we've already addressed to some degree. But at the same time, I don't want you to leave here with the idea that, okay, now I, now I have got to go do something in order to become Christ-like. I've got to, now I got to, now I got to go out and I got to do this and, and I will be Christ-like. What I want you to leave with is really more of a question. This is the question I want, I want to leave with you maybe is the way I should say it. Do I really want to become Christ-like? Do I really want to become Christ-like? Am I willing to pay the cost for Christ-likeness? Am I willing to do that? Or am I just going to continue to live my Christian life in a way that satisfies me personally? You know, I, it's like I mentioned earlier, uh, there are a lot of men that are in the ministry and they love the ministry. They're in love with the ministry. They, they like being in front of people. They like being a leader. 
you know, they, they like being able to have their own schedule. They like a lot of things about the ministry, and they are in love with the ministry, but not necessarily in love with Christ. And there's a big, big difference. And at where we currently are in the study, it, it's not a head issue. It's just not knowing a few principles on becoming Christ-like. It is still, it will always be a matter of the heart. What are you really willing to let God make of your life? I want you to kind of remember with me how Jesus addressed this in John chapter 14 and verse 15. This is what he said. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you really love me, if you love me in the way that you say that you love me, then I want you to keep my commandments. In other words, he didn't just say keep my commandments. He could have said that. He could have said, keep my commandments. But that wasn't really the issue. He fully understood if that, he understands that if somebody doesn't really love him, if somebody doesn't really have an affection for him, that they're going to care less about his commandments. They're not, they're not going to keep his commandments. You, if, if I don't love Christ, I'm not going to do what Christ wants me to do. Why would I want to do that? Why does a lost person have no interest whatsoever in keeping the commandments of God? It's because they don't love God. If you love somebody, then you, you will, in, in this case, if you love Christ, you will find it easy to be obedient to His commandments. I, I think we have to genuinely love Him before we'll ever feel obligated to obey Him. Desire always precedes devotion. De desire always precedes our personal devotion. In John chapter 21, verse 14 to 17, this is when Jesus asked Peter on three different occasions. He says, do you love me? You know, and, and Peter got a little frustrated with him. You know, he asked him three times. And... Uh, he says, do you love me? He asked him that on three different occasions before he ever asked him to feed his sheep. Why? Because this genuine, heartfelt desire always precedes a, a genuine commitment of our life to the things of God. If I have no desire for the things that we're talking about, then I will not have a commitment of my life to the things of God. So consecration, being devoted to Christ, this, this perspective, this kind of spiritual uh, place that we find ourselves, is absolutely critical if we're going to ultimately be committed to becoming Christ-like. I think that consecration is where Christ-likeness actually begins. And, and to me personally, of the three areas, this is kind of the most mysterious of the other three. It's, I, I can, it would be easy to talk about what it means to concentrate on this, or to be committed to this, but consecration is a little bit different. To, to be able to offer anything to God is an absolute mystery to me. I mean, what do I have to offer God? What can I give God? And I was talking to my wife about this one day. She says, well, you can give your life to God. And I said, well, that's true. You know, I, I can give my life to God. I give my life to Christ. I, I, I should, but I, I'm not sure that I have anything that He, he needs. I, I, I need everything he has. He certainly doesn't need anything that I have. I mean, to begin with, I, I have nothing but what God has given to me, and everything that I truly need must come from him and him alone. So how can I give my life to Christ when he's the one that's given life to me? He's given me physical life. He's given me spiritual life. Uh, we derived the term earlier, consecration, from Romans chapter 1, 
uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where we were told to present ourselves to God. And we saw that the tense of that word, the, uh, to present, was in the aorist tense, which refers to something that happened in the past, has a specific impact on, on the present. And so from a, a grammatical perspective, okay, if you just go back and you look at that in a technical way, and I have really tried to stay away from a technical analysis of, I am, uh, I'm a word nut. I, I'm a, if I'm a church nut, I'm a, I'm a word nut. And I spend, I spend the majority of my time studying words, trying to figure out what a word means, the tense of the word and the nuances of the meaning and how it's used in its context. Those are the things that I think give, that's where the treasures in the, in the scriptures actually come from. And so what we find here is that from a grammatical perspective, it's not a recurring verb tense. It's not something where he's saying, well, you have to keep doing this. I think sometimes we feel that it is. You know, I've got to get up today. I've got to commit my life to Christ again. I, you know, I've got to present myself to him as a living sacrifice. Nope, nope, that's not here in this particular tense. It's not a recurring verb tense. It's a one-time event that has a lifetime of application. It's a one-time event that has a lifetime of applying what it is that I've committed myself to, what I've consecrated myself to. The cross, for instance, is generally spoken of in the aorist tense. It happened only once. It does not need to be repeated, but it has an ongoing application to each one of us. I'm to take up my cross. On a, on a daily basis, I'm to keep applying that work of the cross in my life. So the first aspect of becoming Christ-like is the issue of our consecration. Christ-likeness is not automatic. It is not going to happen without effort. You just do not become Christ-like. Romans 12.1 calls this idea of consecration as presenting ourselves or yielding ourselves to God. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. And so what does the word present mean? Is it something that we just do one time or is it something that we have to do all the time? It comes from the Greek word, uh, from the Greek root verb, peristemai, peristemai. And it means to place beside or near, to offer, to place at one's disposal. Para is the prefix to the verb itself, and it means by. And histemai means to set or place. So it literally means to place by. To put something beside something else. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16 uses this same word twice. Listen to what it says. It says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So here the word has the idea of yielding. And the Greek word present is a technical term that was used when the offerer of the Levitical sacrifices placed his offering on the altar so as to, to, to face the holy place. They would take the offering... The priest would do everything that he did to prepare the offering and then they would place it on the altar and they would face the holy place in making that offering. They were bringing it to the Lord. So just get the picture in your mind of someone presenting a living animal on the altar there in the temple ground in the temple courtyard and as they do they are facing the temple proper with the holy place and the holy of holies in front of them. They can't actually see into all of that. 
but it's a very precious picture of someone presenting a living sacrifice to God. So because the word was specifically used in the Septuagint, that is the Greek Old Testament, as a, as a technical term for the sacrifice that was taking place at the altar, it carries the general idea of surrendering or yielding something up in the same way that the sacrifice was being yielded up as an actual living sacrifice. And so the word present is an aorist tense verb in the active voice. An aorist tense verb in the active voice. And I want you to, I want you to keep in mind is that once they placed that animal on, <coughs> on the altar, that was it. They didn't keep coming back and placing that animal on the altar. The animal, the living sacrifice, was. Well, this only happened one time. <coughs> and so, the active voice means that the subject is doing the acting. And so, it would be like uh, the difference between the active voice and the passive voice is the active voice is the subject is doing the acting like the boy hit the ball the passive voice is that the subject is being acted on in other words the boy was hit by the ball so in one case the boy is doing the action in the other case the action is being done to the boy the boy was actually hit by the ball so in this case the subject in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 is us. And, and I beseech you that, that you present. It's, I'm the subject here. You, you're the subject. And the aorist tense refers to something that happened in the past at a very specific time. It, it happened in the past. And it has an impact on on the present. So from that verb form, the word means that this particular presenting of ourselves to God is something that we have to do at a specific point in time, just as the person that was making the sacrifice, facing the holy place, facing the holy of holies on the altar, that they did that, at, they offered that particular sacrifice one time. In, in other words, he didn't come back the next day with the same animal and offer that same animal again. So it had already been offered, and it could only be offered one time. That was it. That animal, it was only good for one offering. And in the same, we, we need to see what we're doing in this aspect of offering our life, becoming a living sacrifice, it's something that we just do one time. It has tremendous ongoing applications as to how that consecration was actually worked out in our life. How we apply that consecration to, to our life. So it's, this is technically, this is not something that we have to repeat every day. I don't have to get up every day and say, well, Lord, I, you know, today I, I commit my life to you afresh. Uh, I, I want to be a living sacrifice today. I do that one time, just based on the tense of these particular words. So, uh, technically, it's just not something we have to do. It's not something that needs to be constantly repeated over and over. But, that act of consecration is not something we have to do over and over, but it is, from a practical standpoint, something that we constantly needed to be reminded of that we have done. Uh, that we have consecrated ourselves to Christ. Listen, technically, I was married to my wife in a wedding ceremony. It was a wonderful day in my life. I, my beautiful bride, and uh, I, much more beautiful than I deserve. And uh, we, we had a we had a wonderful wedding, and in that ceremony, I consecrated my life to my wife. I I took an oath before God, before my family, 
uh, before my friends, uh, you know, uh, before people that were there, uh, and, and I consecrated, I, I devoted my life to my life, uh, to, uh, to my wife, that I would love her for the rest of my life, that I would give my life to protect her and to keep her and to honor her in a way that God wanted me to devote my life to her. And to this day, to this day, we have never repeated that ceremony. But from a practical perspective, we have constantly reminded ourselves of the commitment that we made both to God and to each other on that day in our wedding ceremony. It was, initial, it was an initial consecration of our life. We haven't repeated it, but we are constantly, constantly reminded of it. And I have to work out in the marriage I've been working out for, for the last 42 years what it means to be fully consecrated and fully devoted to my wife. I believe that I'm a much better husband today than I was when we first got married. Why? Because I've been working out in my life what it means to be a better husband. But I haven't had another ceremony. I devoted my life to her one time, and now I've been working through that process of what it means to be consecrated. So for a while, I just want to use the word desire in place of the word consecration in, in relationship to Christ's likeness. And, and you may ask why. It's because until a person has a deep desire to be Christ-like, they will never become Christ-like. So this idea of consecration is something where we where we where our desires are being are being changed or, or, or where we, we we come to a place where that is what we want to happen in our life. For instance, if you do not have a desire or a yearning to be an architect, then it would be futile on my part to keep trying to get you to want to be an architect. I'm an architect. I know a lot about architecture. I, I know a lot about different architectural schools. Um, I, know, I know what it takes to be an architect. I know how difficult the architectural exam is that licenses you. Uh, I know how difficult it is to find work. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 but it, but if you don't have any desire, I, I, you know, my granddaughter, she wants to, she wants to be some kind of uh, marine biologist. Well, it would just be futile for me to talk to her about being an architect. Well, sweetheart, what you really need is you need to re kind of adjust your life so that so that when you go to school, that you can go to an architecture school. Well, she wouldn't, she wouldn't care about that at all. I mean, that would just be absolutely meaningless to her that I talk to her about that she has no desire whatsoever to be an architect. She'd like to be a marine biologist, whatever that is. Well, God help her, you know, uh, I pray that uh, He would strengthen her in what she wants to do. So, on the other hand, if you really wanted to be an architect, then most likely you would heartily listen to what I have to say. You would, you would appreciate the experience. You would appreciate that I um, owned an architectural firm, that I was a partner in an architectural firm. You, you would appreciate that I worked for the world's largest uh, contractor, Bechtel, and that I was, uh, uh, I was the... the the chief of architects. I, I was the the manager of all of the architects at a particular Department of Energy site. I, you you would I, you would appreciate that I've traveled all over the United States uh, as an architect, and, and that I would have you, you you would say well hey give me some input give me give me some advice let you know give me some understanding about what it really means to be. An architect. So, the, you, if you had that desire, you'd be willing to listen. Um, and so, 
So the principle here is very simple. The principle is, is that if a person does not really want something, if they really do not have a desire for something, then in all likelihood they are not going to pursue that. And if Christ's likeness simply does not create an attraction within an individual, then in all likelihood they will not pursue it in their life. It will just be meaningless to them in their life. Whenever my wife and I go out to eat, we generally ask the question, well, where do we want to eat today? You know, uh, you know, once all our kids, I, I, my, older, my youngest son still lives with us, and uh, uh, he's not married, but uh, he lives with us. But, uh, you know, since all the kids are gone, and uh, we have a tendency sometimes to eat out uh, whenever we want to, you know. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, we always ask the question, well, where do you want to, where do we want to go to eat tonight? And we will often say, well, I, I don't want Mexican tonight, or I don't want Chinese. You know, I can't ever remember, I, I know this is kind of a little silly illustration, but I can't ever remember going to a restaurant that I said I didn't want to go to. You know, I, I don't, I don't really care about, uh, uh, you know, Mexican tonight, or I, 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 I don't want to go to a Japanese place, or, you know, I, I don't want to go to this restaurant or that restaurant. You know why? Because we have no desire to go there. We have a little place here, Nate, and, uh, where I live. Uh, we have this uh, place that's called the Wing Place. And they have the best wings, and they have the best salad, and I just love going there. I mean, I just love going there. Oh, they have great French fries, which are really not on my diet. The wings aren't on my diet, and I just love going there. Uh, we don't go there very often, but all I have to do, I said, "Well, you'd like to go to the wings place tonight?" And next thing I know, my wife said, "Yes, sir." Well, she'll be getting dressed, and off we go. And so. Uh, we just do not want to be engaged in things that we don't want to do. I, I have no desire to go hunting. I, I, you, you, I don't want to kill anything. Uh, I, I believe that one of my primary spiritual gifts is the gift of mercy. Maybe my primary gift is the gift of mercy. And uh, listen, if I run over a squirrel, if I run over a squirrel, I, I, I want to stop the car and have a funeral. I just feel really bad about killing the squirrel. I just, I can't, I don't like killing anything. I don't even like to go fishing because if you've ever been fishing and you caught a fish and it got stuck in their eye and you, or you, you know, the, the, the hook is way down in their throat and you can't get it out, you got to pull it out, you got to get some pliers and, you know, the, the fish is just sitting there kind of looking at you like, would you please, you know, please. You know, um, well, you know, it's it's not a big thing, not a big thing, but it's just not something I enjoy doing. So I don't go hunting. I'm not a deer hunter. I'm not a bird hunter. I'm not a squirrel hunter. I'm not a rabbit hunter. I don't like to fish. I, I don't like to kill things. I, I'm not. So I don't do any of that. I I do like uh, to to build things. So I build things. Um, desire creates direction and trends and objectives. I, I built my own house. I literally, physically built my own house. There were certain things I couldn't do. I couldn't put in the block work, didn't know how to do that. But I, I, I did everything else. Uh, I, you know, we put in the electrical, we, 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 uh, I, I didn't put in the mechanical, we put in all the plumbing, did all the framing put all the trim up, uh, you know, um, uh, help my daughter on her house to enclose the, the upstairs, the attic space that was there, and did all the sheetrock. I just finished uh, enclosing the porch, uh, did all the siding and the, uh, the vinyl siding and everything, and put in all the windows. Why? Because I really, I'm an architect, I really enjoy building things. I mean, I really enjoy building different things. And so, we're just not prone 
to do things that we don't like. But desire creates directions, it creates trends, it creates objectives in our life. So Christ-likeness is something that we really have to desire and something that we really need to present, well, I mean want to be present in our life. I, I, I know that some of you are, you're probably bored to tears. You're probably saying, what is this? This guy, he just keeps saying the same thing over and over and over. And you're absolutely correct. You want to know why? If there was one characteristic that we probably could identify about the church in the day and age in which we live is that we see very little of Christ. We see very little Christ likeness. We missed it. We've missed it. We've become so infatuated with ourselves and with our ideas and, and with our own personal goals and with who we are and what we do and how we do it. That the treasure stays in, in inside. And it never, ever gets released. See, my job as a pastor, my job as a professor, is to stir the pot. I, I understand that part of what I do. I, it's like I, I just... I have to keep stirring the pot. I have to keep, keep, you know, put the paddle in and move it around. I have to keep things cooking. I have to keep saying things. I, I tell my church all the time. I, I, I just tell them all the time. I never let them forget. But you can't be a follower of Christ without following Christ. You can't be committed to Christ without being committed. You can't be committed to Christ and be unfaithful to Christ. At the same time, the two things do not exist together. And so, Christ-likeness is something that we have to desire. And, and I, I think it must be a strong desire that I'm just not willing to let go of my life. Here's the problem. Here's the problem that exists. Most Christians would certainly approve of the idea of being Christ-like. If we were to ask anybody in the church, do you think it's a good thing to be Christ-like? Every single one of them are going to say, well, yeah, absolutely. We're going to get a hearty, wholesome, 100% agreement. I, I doubt, if I were to go in my church this Sunday and I were to say, hey, does anybody here uh, think that Christ-likeness is really not that important? Everybody's going to say yes. I would be stunned if somebody said, no, that's not really that important. I would be, I would be staggered. If somebody said that. And so most Christians approve of the idea of being Christ-like. In fact, if asked, they would readily endorse it as a meaningful truth and, and, and principle in their life that's good to pursue, but they may never really embrace true Christ-likeness because no matter how much they intellectually agree with the idea, they never have developed a desire to be Christ-like just never happened. Just does not exist in a practical sense. It's just not something that on a regular basis they even think about. It's not something that they've kind of devoted themselves to or given their life to. In essence, it's a great idea, but not really one worth pursuing. And so they, in their mind, it's just, it's too much. It, you know, it's, it's for the, it's for the, it's for the, those people. But it's not for them personally. So our problem is that we are more than willing to embrace, embrace all of this intellectually, but unfortunately we fail to embrace it spiritually or fail to embrace it morally. And because a believer may not have a genuine desire to be Christ-like, only an intellectual acceptance of it as an idea, they never devote themselves to it and they never actively pursue it and hardly ever become Christ-like. What a tragedy. What an absolute tragedy. 
to absolutely miss one of the primary goals that God has sanctioned for us to achieve. This idea of becoming Christ-like. So here's the practical question that I think that we have to ask ourselves relative to the issue of becoming Christ-like. Is this something that I really desire? Is this what I really want? Is this what I'm really willing to pay the cost for, to be involved in? Now, in my mind, the worst thing that you can do at that point, the worst thing that right now, even as I'm teaching, that you can do at this point, if you are engaged with me in what it is that we are addressing here, is to quickly respond and say, oh yes, no problem, that's really what I want. That's exactly what I want in my life. There's no question, there's no doubt in my mind that that's exactly what I want. I want to be Christ-like. I, I want to be one of the most Christ-like Christians that there could be. And if your tendency is to respond that way, then in my mind you may be self-deceived and probably have never really counted the cost of what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Christ. Just never counted the cost. There's such an immense cost to what we are talking about. Jesus says in Luke 14, Now great multitudes went with him in verse 25, And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Wow, well that, that puts things into a different perspective. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish all who see it begin to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. There is a cost to Christ likeness. It's going to cost you. And the first thing that you need to do before you make a consecration to Christ that you are not willing to fulfill is that you count the cost. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus spoke these very demanding, very intense words when He said, Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself. Do you remember what happened to many of his so-called disciples when he began to make demands on them? In John chapter 6, John chapter 6, um, Jesus had been speaking, and this is what he says, I'm going to make sure I have the right verse here. Give you two of them. And Jesus had been speaking in, in um, um, this passage, and he was talking about his, uh, the, him being the living bread, and the bread that I shall give is my flesh. Verse 51. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of God, of man, and drink His blood, you have no life in Him. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He continues to talk about eating His flesh, drinking His blood. And it says, therefore, in verse 60, that many of His disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And then in verse 66, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Did 
just that's a little too hard for me. That's a little too difficult. I don't really understand that. So. See you, Jesus. And just walk with him no more. Personally, I, I can't read something like Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 about denying myself, taking up my cross, following him without understanding it has tremendous demands on my life. Its implications for my everyday life are absolutely enormous. Boy, do you think that there's something here that ought to at least help us to understand and appreciate how much we need the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life? Do you think that it's possible for me to do these kind of things without His work and ministry? In my life, I, these, these implications of what we're talking and studying about here are so enormous and so demanding. This is not just get up and have a Bible study in the morning. I mean, he's saying that I have, a, I have to deny what I consider my personal right to my individual self and to yield it to him. And I do not think that's an easy thing for any of us to do. I don't think any of us want to do that in a natural way. I mean, if, if we think that that's an easy thing, I, I just think that we're self-deceived. So what are you really willing to deny yourself of? I, I think that when God talks about things like surrendering ourselves and presenting ourselves and denying ourselves, He's not just talking about giving up this or, or, or giving up that thing, not at all. He's talking about the deliberate giving up of my personal right to my individual self, to life as I want to live it. I'm giving it all to Him. Now that's what it means to be consecrated. Let me ask a question to kind of amplify all of this. Do you think that there is a great cost in no longer living as we want to live? Yes or no? I do. I think there's a great cost. My answer to that is yes. There's a great cost in me not being will, able to live in the way that I want to live. I, I have a certain lifestyle, right? I, I live in a certain place. I, we, we, we live a certain way. We eat a certain way. We, we drive certain automobiles and trucks. And I live on a farm. I, I'm not a farmer, but I live on a farm. And, and it, it takes a lot of effort just, just to keep it up. Just, just, just cutting the fields is a, is a big deal. In fact, I, I think that the cost is colossal that we're talking about. It's massive. <laughs> it's huge. Maybe that's the reason that nobody is really willing to pay it. It's also a cost that I do not think that the average Christian, myself included, clearly understands or even appreciates. You know how much these men that Jesus is talking to Do you know how much it costs them to be a disciple of Christ? It costs them their life. Every single one of them, it costs them their life. And many Christians live in a very non-demanding Christian environment, and in so doing, the true cross, the true cost of being a, a Christian is absolutely non-existent. I mean, how many churches could you go to? This weekend on a Sunday, how many places could you go to where there are absolutely no demands made on the Christian? Some nice little sermonette. You know, the way I say it is that sermonettes are for Christianettes. And I'm not as interested in being a Christianette. And I'm not interested in making the people in my church to be Christianettes. I want them to be disciples. I want to be a disciple. And the cost of that is demanding. It's, it's, it's a massive cost. And my understanding, the opposite of consecration is desecration. Whereas consecration involves a willful dedication of my life to Christ, desecration involves an actual defilement and irreverence for the things of God, 
within my life. It's a treating something sacred in a profane way. It's taking something that's sacred to God. I believe that a church is sacred to God. I believe it's the, the bride of Christ. And yet there's so many Christians that treat the church as just, just something that's... They're indifferent to it. They're lethargic to it. They have no commitment to it. I believe that the Word of God is sacred. And yet some people, they have Bibles, they just stay on a shelf. Never read, just treat it as if it's just indifferent to it. They treat it like it's a profane thing. Let me give you one obvious example of this in Scripture. In John chapter 2, Jesus is in the temple. And it says in verse 13, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and He found... In the temple, those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. I mean, Jesus had entered into the temple, and when he got there, he found that the people had made it a house of merchandise. A place where they were buying and selling for profit and personal gain. It angered him. It angered him in a righteous way. And so he began to turn over the tables and to pour out the money changers uh, to, to take their money and to pour it out and to overthrow their tables. And what was taking place in God's holy temple was wrong and defiling and irreverent. And so Christ overthrew it and he drew, drove all of them out They were treating something that was sacred in a profane way. I think that in the book of Hebrews, if you'll turn there with me in Hebrews chapter 10, I, I believe that this is clearly identified. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28, it says, Or how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. In other words, an insult to the Spirit of grace. They've taken here the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified and treated it as if it's a common thing. They've taken something that's sacred and treated it as it, they've been indifferent to it. They've treated it in a profane way. I think in a more practical application for us today, our bodies are described in Romans chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 as being the temple of the Holy Spirit. We, we have to glorify God in our body. And yet we can treat our bodies in, in a profane way. You know, if you've ever been taken hold by the Holy Spirit in your life, and if you have truly consecrated and dedicated your life to Christ, then please do not think it a strange thing do not think it a strange thing concerning the work of the Holy Spirit to cleanse your life of everything that defiles His temple and diminishes His glory. That is a work that is going to take place. The Holy Spirit is going to cleanse your life. If your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, He is going to remove out of your life every single thing that defiles that temple and diminishes the very glory of Christ in your life. And if what is in my life is not there for Christ-like and not honoring to Christ, then the Holy Spirit, just like Christ, will overturn it and cast it out. And I hope that He does. It is up to me to stand for the honor of Christ in my life and in my body. The Spirit of God will not allow me 
to just use my body for my own pleasure and my own convenience as a bond slave. My body is to be His and my life is to be His and I am to be consecrated to Him. There's a cost. So don't take this idea of consecration and oh yes, I love Jesus and oh yes, I'm going to consecrate my life to Christ and oh yes, I'm going to do this and that. There is a cost and if you do not count the cost, you'll be sadly disappointed later on. Now at this point, we have to personally address this issue of our consecration to Christ and His purposes. And what are we genuine, genuinely and honestly willing to consecrate to Christ? I mean, if he wants everything, I mean, I guess the answer should be everything, right? This is a hard issue. And here are the questions again. That however you decide to do it, I want you to wrestle with. I, I want to give you these questions again. I want you to struggle. <laughs> I'm creating a struggle in your heart. I, you, you, could, you might just be sitting there, oh, I've heard this before. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah, I've heard this. I, I understand. Oh, uh, here he goes again. I'm creating the struggle for you. I'm addressing the critical issues. And the critical issue is not that I'm addressing it. The critical issue is whether you and I are willing to allow the issues to address us. Here are the questions. Do I really want to become Christ-like? <laughs> Do I really, really want to become Christ-like? Am I really willing to pay the cost for Christ-likeness? And do I even understand what it means to be Christ-like? And if so, am I Christ-like in my life? Those are the questions that we presented earlier. I want you to struggle with those questions. I want you to fight. I want you to struggle with them until you genuinely know in your heart if you do not want to become Christ-like or if you do want to become Christ-like. Dr. Sullivan, who is uh, the president of Covington Seminary, was at my church a while back and we were eating supper after the service. Uh, he had spoken in the service and and um, he had said something that really spoke to me. I thought this was great. We are just sitting there and having supper, and he and my wife and I. He says, you know, you just cannot trip God. <laughs> and I, you know, I, and just the way it came across, just the way that he said it, he said, you just, you cannot trick God. He, he's not someone that can be hoodwinked and somebody that can be conned into believing that we're something that we really or not. You know, if Jesus Christ was here in bodily form and he was talking to us at some point in the conversation, this is what he would ask. I think this is what he would ask. He would say, pastors, servants, do you really love me? Gary, do you really love me or are you willing to pay the cost that it will become, that it will cost you to become like me? And to become a living sacrifice? Or are you really willing to die to yourself and take up your cross and follow me? Or are you willing to lay aside what you want to do in your life for what I want you to do? Gary, do you really love me that much? I mean, do you really, really love me that much? Would you be willing to die for me? Would you be willing to go someplace and give your life knowing that it was a dangerous place to go? Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to go where nobody else wants to go if I called you? Would you really be willing to die for me? You see, without a heartfelt desire on our part to really be Christ like anything else that we talk about, will be just that. It will just be mere talk and meaningless words and superficial conversation at best. Until I had this deep, heartfelt desire, this consecration in my life, 
I, I, I've got to be like Christ. I'm, I'm going to give my life to be like Christ. It's a hard issue for me, and it, it's, a, it's a hard issue for you. It's something you have to struggle with. And I hope that the Holy Spirit will just drive you, just drive you, just compel you to a place where you're sincerely, sincerely willing to allow Him to ask you the searching questions about your life and where you are and if you're really dedicated and committed to Christ. Now I want to talk about the second area. We want to talk about the area of consecration, concentration. Concentration. When I speak of concentration, I, I have in mind a very strong and deliberate giving of my attention to what I believe to be the will of God for my life. very strong, a very deliberate giving of my life to what I be, believe to be the will of God for my life. Let's say, for instance, that you believe that God has called you to do something. I mean, God has called you, and we'll just say a ministry. God has called you, I mean, maybe you're a pastor and, and, and that, that's really what you want to be. I mean, I, I don't know what it may be. Fine. But God's really called you to do that, and you know that God's called you to do that. Why? And, 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 and so at that point, you have to give your attention. You have to concentrate on what it is that God wants you to do. How does that get worked out in your life? I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor foremost, first and foremost. As much as I travel, as much as I travel, I'm a pastor. First and foremost, you know, it would be, it would would really be difficult for me to go to another church, just as a member of a church. Uh, I I uh, this is the only church that I've pastored. Uh, the church that I pastor is the only one that I pastored. It's the only one I ever intend to pastor. Uh, it, and, but if if something happened and 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 I I just had to go, it, it would be very difficult for me to just be a member of a church. Maybe when I get to be really old and, 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 and just Alzheimer's takes over and I'm physically, uh, you know, limited in what I can do and I have to be a member of a church, things may be a little different. But until that point in time, it'd be hard for me just to be a member because God's called me to be a pastor. God's given me past, uh, not only a pastoral calling, He's given me pastoral gifts and, 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 and what I would consider to be ministry gifts. To lead and to guide and, and to protect and I, I'm, I'm like a mother hen over chicks um, I, I, I've been called by God to do something but I don't just get up in the morning and, and do that I, there, I, there has to be something very deliberate about my life there has to be something incredibly deliberate about what I'm doing and how I'm living and how my life is structured. I have to concentrate on those things. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13 if you would. Take a moment and just turn there. It's a passage of scripture where, where Paul is talking to Timothy, his protege. Timothy had actually been with Paul for about 15 years. And he says in verse 13, he says, Till I come, give attention to reading. Actually, it's to the reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And he says, I, I want you to give attention to something. That's what we're talking about here when we talk about concentration. And so Paul was talking to Timothy about some of those things that he needed to do and some of those things that he needed to to concentrate on in order to be a good pastor and pastor and the phrase give attention to literally means to hold the mind to something it means that that you would actually be concentrating on on something strong says that it means to pay attention to to be cautious about to apply oneself to to adhere to you're 
concentrating on this particular area. It's often translated as take heed to or give heed to. For instance, speaking of the second coming, Jesus said these words in Luke chapter 21 and verse 34. He said, but take heed to yourselves. Concentrate. Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life and that day come on you unexpectedly. See, the whole idea there is that prior to the second coming, and I, I will just, I'll leave it there in the context. There is be a lot of distractions to keep people from being reminded of what's really going to take place. And therefore we need to take special heed as that time approaches. Seems to me like it's getting closer and closer and he says, hey, your heart can be weighed down. You can be distracted. There can be all these, the cares of this life just the cares of this life and they and they overtake you and he says here it's just uh, the idea of giving attention to things that are important in your life giving yourself to things like the Word of God and to fellowship with believers and we need to understand that God is not just saying to just give your attention to things that are important to you. I think that's where we really get a little bit off track. We, we, we're, we're going to concentrate on everything that's important to us, which is exactly what we most often do, but rather to give attention and to concentrate on those things that He says are important and those things that honor Him. I know this is going to sound harsh and... So please just forgive me and just adjust it, if you would. Just try to hear what I'm trying to say, because I, I, I'm not. I don't mean to say the wrong thing or to say it in a in a in an ugly way, but you you know there's there's some people I think that they they worship their children more than they worship God. Um, they everything revolves around their children all the priorities of their life and everything revolves around their children listen you ought to be a great parent I mean you're a Christian you ought to be a great great parent you ought to love your children you ought to raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of Christ you ought to teach them. You ought to be the, you know, the Deuteronomy father. You know, when you're, when you're eating, when you're walking in the way, when you're lying down, when you just every every, you know, that we ought to be good parents. That's that's a part of being a Christian. That's a part of being committed and consecrated to Christ. But I know some parents that they they're that they worship their kids more than they worship Christ. I I have a. A family that I know of, and uh, uh, they they uh, their their son plays um, football. Plays uh, he's a young fellow. He's in middle school, and he's really, I'm sure, pretty good. Uh, he's a running back or something like that, you know, and. Uh, they will adjust all of their priorities, all of their priorities, for him and his games. So if they had a game on a Wednesday night, well, they're, they're not going to go to church. They're going to go to his game. And so every night, they have to, they live way out in the country, and so every day they have to drive probably 15 miles to get to where they have the practice, uh, the husband actually works the night shift and he takes off work to go uh, to go and be uh, one of the coaches 
Um, I mean, we're talking about two cars. We're talking about the husband going, the wife driving. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, on the other days that they don't practice, he takes karate or whatever they call it, and they do that on, uh, I think, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I'm sure they have a, a it may be just a Friday and a Saturday, and they got to drive into town, and, and they have all these meets they go to, and all that kind of stuff, and it's like they worship their child. And, and they've made God secondary. Is there anything wrong with our kids playing football? No. Anything wrong with them taking karate? No. No, that's, that's, those are perfectly good things. I, I like football. I, I, maybe I need to know some karate. But not at the expense of losing my priority to the things of God. You see, there's a cost involved. And sometimes that cost has, is going to affect other people in our life. There's just some things I have to, I have to concentrate on. It, it's, 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 I, I can't just casually be indifferent to the things of God. I understand, I, I understand from a practical perspective that we cannot give our attention to everything at once. I, I can't concentrate on everything at one time. I, I'm teaching a class here. This is a, 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 a seminary online course. I, I'm teaching a class. And it takes time. And I, I can't do this and I can't do three or four other things at the same time. I, I wouldn't, it's just not possible. I have to concentrate on just certain things. I think it'd be mentally, physically, and emotionally impossible but there are some foundational areas. There are absolutely foundational areas to which we need to give our undivided attention. And unfortunately, there are distractions. <laughs> I mean, we get, we get weighed down with the cares of this life. And we, we lose our focus and we lose our priority. And unfortunately, the distractions keep us from being attentive to those things. That can be overwhelming at times. Jesus called them the cares of this life. How many, how many people do you know that are absolutely distracted with the cares of this life? I mean, everything in their life revolves around themselves and their activities and riding their bikes and walking and running and exercising and going out to eat and getting the right clothes and having the nice cars and washing them and what are those things? Are, are they bad? No, 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 no. It's okay to wash your car. It's okay to go out to eat. It's okay to exercise. But they're the cares of this life and they begin to take a priority over the spiritual priorities and the foundational areas that ought to be in our life. This particular area of Christ likeness is one of those foundational areas I believe that God wants each of us to have a great deal of attention to or to give a great deal of attention to. I've come to the subtle conclusion that Christ is God the Father's spiritual magnet. That Christ is God the Father's spiritual magnet. I, I, I would put it this way. He is really all that we have to offer. Christ is all that I have to offer. If I'm talking to somebody, if I'm involved in somebody's life, and if I'm pastoring, if, if I'm working, uh, 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 if I'm trying to be helpful to somebody, the only thing that I have to offer them is Christ. It's not principles and rules. I have to, all I have to offer them is Christ. People's lives will not be changed by some doctrinal understanding they have or some denominational slant that they accept. That's good and we should always be as doctrinally, as doctrinally correct as is humanly possible and spiritually possible, but doctrine is not what is life transforming. It's, it's foundational. I teach doctrine all the time. 
My whole life is built around teaching doctrine. Teaching good, sound doctrine. Because you've got to have the right foundation. But doctrine is not what is life transforming. Christ is life transforming. Christ. Jesus Christ is what is life transforming. He is the one that transforms us. He is the one who changes us. Jesus was talking to his disciples in John chapter 14 and verse 9. And he says these words, He who has seen me has seen the Father. In other words, God is not embodied in a doctrine. God is incarnated in a person. He didn't say, He who has seen me has understood the doctrine of the incarnation. He said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. God the Father is embodied in the person of Christ, not in a doctrine. And the more intimately that I know Christ and the more that I know God, ultimately the more Christ-like I will become, we will become. You know, unfortunately, I think for many Christians, it seems like their main emphasis is always about what they can get out of the Christian life. You know, it's this, the secret of the Christian life. It's, it's what they can get from God rather than knowing God that is the issue. I, I, I'm not sure why, but there just seems to be this widespread confusion about what it, the Christian life really is. It seems that it's always about what Christianity is going to do for me. What it is, what Christianity is going to give me. What it's going to provide for me. And so the answers that we hear could be just about anything. I mean, we hear them all the time. These are words that are not new to any of us that are familiar with what's going on in our Christian culture. But the answers that we hear is that... It's about our health and our wealth and our peace of mind and a better career and ultimate fulfillment and personal happiness and contentment. Just about anything. We could put it this way. What do you want? What is it that you want? Well, supposedly, that's what Christianity will give you. Whatever it is that you want. What kind of facility do you want to worship in? You know? What kind of car do you want to drive? Well, you know, God, that's what God will give you. Supposedly, that's what Christianity will give to you. Just whatever makes you happy and whatever satisfies you and your dreams and your personal ambitions and what works out in accordance with what's convenient to you. Whatever you want to be, then God will certainly help you get there. You know, you want to be this? Well, God, God will really help you. To be what you want to be. Now I have to ask the question. Do we really think all of that's true? Do you really believe and think that all of that is true? I hope not. I hope we do not think that. I mean, what an incredibly confusing message all of that is. It's not only confusing and perplexing, but it's very, very unbiblical. Do you really know what Christianity offers to you? It offers Christ to you. It offers the Lord Jesus Christ to you. It's not health and wealth and money and convenience and comfort and creature comforts. It offers you the God-man, Jesus Christ. <coughs> that is exactly, <coughs> excuse me, what Christianity offers to us. What an amazing offer. You know, the surpassing theme of all of Scripture is the person of Christ. If you do not have Christ, then in reality, you have nothing of any eternal value but if you have Christ, 
then you have <coughs> you have everything. <laughs> you have everything. I mean, what more is there? It's either all or nothing, right? Christ is all that we have to offer. He's it. Why? Because He's all that we need. And that is what is so often what we do not understand. It's never about what I can get from God. Ever. Ever. It's never about me. I mean, God will take care of you. You know, just seek His kingdom first and His righteousness and what you need in your life will be added to you. But that's not the goal. That's not the goal to get what I want. The goal is to, is to do what God wants me to do and to honor Him. It's never about us. Why? Because we have already been given every spiritual blessing that there is. Ephesians 1, 3 states this truth this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. If I'm in Christ, I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing that there is. And they're in Christ. We've already been given every spiritual blessing that God has to give. But the problem is that those blessings are in Christ. And that's where the rub starts. You know, if you really and genuinely want to enjoy the blessings of God on your life, then Christ is where you begin and it's where you remain. You begin with Christ and you continue with Christ. Why? It's because all of God's spiritual blessings are in Christ. That's why this area of Christ-likeness is so foundational. Obviously, we cannot enjoy the spiritual blessings of Christ if we're not Christ-like. It'd be foolish on our part to think that God just bestows His rich blessings on those who are very un-Christ-like in their lifestyle and in their behavior. The blessings are there, but they are just not made available to those that are Christ-like. God's a good steward. He's not just going to pass out blessings on those people that do not appreciate them. Colossians 2, 9 and 10 says that we are complete in Christ. We're already complete. But it's in Christ. Listen, and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And so the message is so very, very simple. It's about Christ and it's about knowing Christ. In fact, Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, he said, For to me to live is Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 8, he said, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost, lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and counted them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And the word there for rubbish means manure. Some of the translations is actually translated as dung or refuse. What an amazing statement. Everything, everything that was important to me, I just count it as manure for the excellence of knowing Christ Jesus. I'm going to stop there. We will pick up and finish out our course. Uh, lesson number 16 in our next, uh, in our next uh, session. Thank you.